This is an interview with Colonel Richard Keeney, K-E-N-N-E-Y, U, uh, U.S. Air Force, retired. Uh, he was uh, born and raised in Coronado and was a P-38 pilot at the 12th Air Force and was shot down and a POW. Uh, he lives at 337 Glorieta Place, Coronado. Uh, and um, this interview is being done for the Aerospace Museum and possibly the San Diego Historical Society. My name is Robert G. Wright. The date is May the 16th, 2007. Okay. Could you give me a full name, please? My name is Richard F. Kenny. That's K E N N Y. -E -Y. And where were you born? I was Richard? born in Santa Cruz, California, on March 2nd, 2020. Mar March, March 2nd, 2nd 1920. 1920. That means. It's yeah, easy. That's a ways back. You can always tell it fa how fast you are because it's really easy for yeah. 207. In other yeah. words, I live to be 87 some miraculous way as a fighter pilot. Okay. Uh, uh, when did you come to uh, San Diego then? Well, I, I, my family, my father was a naval officer and retired. And, he was a naval we, officer? Yes, and we retired and came to Coronado in, in ni three years old. I was three years old in 1923, and I went through Coronado school system, grammar school and high school, and graduated in 38 and, and went to San Diego State, <coughs> and uh, then uh, I joined the Naval Reserves when I was 17 to get a, a, a chance at their 25 appointments to Annapolis, and and I had a 25 from my father, presidential, but it was all on <coughs> highest uh, scores on tests, and I was trying to get maximize my chances, and and so. In uh, 1942 years in college, they called our outfit to active duty in the squadron, <coughs> Naval Reserve Squadron in San Diego. And uh, the reason was that President Roosevelt had given 50 destroyers, Lend Lees, to the British to help. <coughs> convoy of the North Atlantic, and they called our outfit tactic duty to, to man the destroyers. And uh, I had <clears throat> been on a, on that tin can, which was 300 feet long, 30 feet wide, round bottom, no air conditioned stunt. And uh, I, I had no, no idea, I mean, no. I wasn't going to be a a sailor on a puke barge if I could get out of it, and so uh -huh. I immediately put in for aviation cadets and for the naval aviation naval navcad program. Yeah, and uh, and I got a letter from the army saying that I had a first alternate appointment to West Point. And the principal had <coughs> the principal had failed, had n not uh, qualified. So go to Fort Rosecrans for a pre-induction physical. So I went to Fort Rosecrans, which at that time was an army base on Point Loma, and, and uh, <coughs> for my physical, and, and I. 
had high blood pressure and the guy let me come back the next day and I had higher blood pressure. And you were nervous? Yeah, and then I had white coat syndrome, <laughs> an early version. So I came home and my doctor in Coronado <coughs> was a, I'd sailed with his son on a starboat and we, so he petted me and gave me a t check and said, no, you're fine. He, he called the guy up and his name was Dr. Peters and he's a full colonel and he called him up and he said, I've had this, yeah, this kid for years and he's fine. And the guy said, send him back. <laughs> yeah. so, so the next day I went back over there and I had, I still remember I was sweating all the way down. It was, running down to my tennis shoes <laughs> and the guy, the colonel said, well, if, if it's just that you get excited taking physical, you wouldn't be any good in the service anyway. So he flunked me. Flunked you again? Yeah. So three times in a row. So anyway, right at that time they'd already called us up and I had my duffel bag and my sea bag over my shoulder and I reported over to the to the <coughs> Naval Training Station where they're organizing our outfit and I, <coughs> but just then a letter came through that I'd written for the, trying to get in aviation and I got appointed or I got approved for the cadets, Army Air Corps. So I took my letter over to the squadron commander and I said, I'd like a release so I can go into the flight program. And he said, you snivelers, my outfit's falling apart. I'm not going to let you guys out. out. Bah, bah, bah. So I came home and I was going with uh, Admiral King's daughter, Millie King. She had four daughters and a son. And I knew them all. And I was... And I was you knew Admiral King? <laughs> Yeah, and at that time, that was before his CNO, and he had some, I don't know what his job was. Doing. Anyway, I, I groused and said, hey, I got an appointment. I mean, I got approval to go into the aviation cadets, and the guy won't let me out. And he picked up the phone, and he, he told his commander, he said, we need aviators more than you need sailors. Let him out. So, <laughs> so I... I got out, <clears throat> I was out one day and back in the, and went then to Cal Aero, which is up there in Oxnard for flight training and Army Air Corps. And this, this was in 1941 by that time? That was in 1941, uh, just before Pearl Harbor. Okay, November. And then there. while I was in the cadets and flight training, Pearl Harbor happened, and I would remember that. I don't remember a lot of things, but I remember I was in the movie, and they said, everyone report back to your bases, and and we went back there, and they had us shoulder arms fought walking the perimeter of these primary trainers, which were biplanes. Yeah. And, to protect them from the Japanese invasion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, then I, I um, had my older brother was in my had put in for for it and was in my same class. We, we went as roommates and we took one car. Cause we what was to, your brother's name? My brother's name was Clayton, Clayton. and uh, and anyway, we had primary flight train. The, the people that had been in before and everything said, "Don't tell them you know anything about flying because they want to train you." And they're, 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 and a good friend of mine that was Coronado, Coronado, <coughs> with me for years had been. In, in a year earlier, and and he was a lieutenant, and he said, he was the one that took and briefed me and said, don't do it. And so anyway, I was there, and they were 
this is a rut or this is a aileron, this is not, you know, and, and, and I'd <coughs> already been, I already had a pilot's license. And now, just hold a minute for a second here. I want to try something out. Uh, you talk low and I want to uh, be sure this thing is working. The volume. You're awfully low. Uh, right. You want to tip more uh, towards me? Or? Well, or now what we could do is, uh, uh, yeah, right there. Okay, uh, uh, let's, let's, can we back up a bit? All right. Yeah. yeah, we're getting out of court. Uh, hey, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, um, uh, I really wanted to start uh, by asking you about Coronado, but I think we'll go back to Coronado later on. Uh, being growing up here, but you were up in Oxnard for flight training. Yes. Now. I didn't know that you had ha already had some. Uh, had, had right in flying. college, I took CAP and I I flew out. I soloed out of Lindbergh Field. When and you were I, a teenager. Pardon? When yes. You were a teenager. And I got a license in 1940. And what kind of aircraft were you flying then? Well, I was flying. <coughs> I was flying up through a Ryan STA, if you know I know, know what it. that is. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a nice little, little monocoque airplane built by Ryan. And, uh, was it an e easy plane to fly? Well, yeah. I <coughs> At that time, it, it was advanced little airplane for, for me. You know, I'd gone through the program in Cubs fly, uh, and... Uh, and then I got into advanced CPT, they call it, with the, and then I got recalled. That's when I got called in, when I was in that program, actually, when I got called yeah. into, the, into the Army and Air Corps. And that's when, uh, the, that's where I, they said, don't tell them anything, so I didn't. And, uh, and the first time I went up with an instructor, he said, well, now you follow me through on this and that, now this. And then he said, all right, now you try it. Do a left turn. Do a right turn. How much time do you have? <laughs> and then he cheered me out for not telling him. He said, we don't have enough time to fool around and everything. So, he gave me to the stage commander as his only student, and which was the guy in charge of the whole, whole training thing. His name was Otto von Temsky, <laughs> <laughs> and he was a tough, tough German. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, I, I had no real problems getting through there, and and they, they selected me to go to P thirty eight training. And and uh, they didn't select my brother, so I went to the common of cadets that was one later became famous for writing a book, but uh, he was. I told I told him him it was a major than S Scott, and I said. Uh, we're a brother team, and we came in with a problem, and I didn't sell, so I went off to, in other words, they said, hey, that was too bad, that was a recruiting problem. <laughs> but anyway, I went to basic at Taft, and and they had basic there, but it wasn't in the program I was in, and so we split, and, and uh, I went to Taft, and 
which is up there in the potato country. And, uh, <coughs> and then I... That's Taft, California. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the Sacramento Valley. And then I went, after graduating from basic, in, at, from Taft, I went to Stockton Field, Northern California. I flew a twi twin engines, and they were a little, they were bamboo bombers, we call them. They were low performing, lousy twin engine little airplane, and figured. Yeah, that was a beach, I think. Beach aircraft. It was a C Cessna. Yeah, a Cessna. Okay. And they, and I thought they'll never make me a fighter pilot out of this outfit. They'll send us to bombers. And so I was really, you know, pretty disappointed that I got AT-17s, which are <laughs> low grade. But anyway, I graduated from there in uh, April 1942, and I got orders to Hamilton Field, a P-38 outfit. And they gave us half a day travel time to get from Stockton to, to northern San Francisco. They had uh, uh, P-38s was a. Uh, uh, I've been, I've been up right close to one of those things, and they're a big, they're a big airplane. And mm -hmm. the, the development of them was a long process. I didn't realize they had them uh, squadron ready in, in uh, the middle of uh, 42, but I guess they did. Yeah, the, at that time, the P-38 was, was the best, you know, fighter we had, and uh, it was the cream of the crop really then. Yeah, and uh, P-47 was, was coming P along. P-47 was later. And the P-51 was later yet. One was later yet. Both of them were later. And the P-40 was contemporary, but it was a no-show as, as well as uh, when it came to a P-38. Yeah. And the Navy had the F-4F, F, which was a Grumman before the F-6F, and, uh -huh. and that was, you could beat the heck out of those guys. So the 38 was the, I felt like, you know, that was the, you were the, really the top you, of the feeding. You, did you, were you kind of uh, impressed with it? Yeah, it, it was a, it was a very good airplane, and, and uh, I, I, did they have? Did they have a a, a trainer, a duel? No. You the first time you flew it was by yourself. Yeah, they just briefed you on it, and off you went. And, and the main thing was you hoped you didn't have an engine failure on takeoff. So before you learn the airplane, or anyway after you learn the airplane. So, but well, an engine. You got two engines. Um, the only time you really worry about it is on takeoff. Yeah, that was the main, that was the time you worried about it. It, yeah. was, it had actually on takeoff power, if you had an engine failure, you had to pull the throttle back, not push it forward. And, and that's what got a lot of people in trouble. Because it would Yeah, it would yaw, yaw on. And yeah. You had to have flying speed, single engine flying speed. Yeah. Well, anyway, we had, uh, I was sent to this old top heavy with rank outfit, and they had majors as flight commanders and, and captains as element leaders, and I was a little old second lieutenant. And, you were just a, you were a lieutenant? Yeah. Yeah. The second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. <laughs> the lowest right. you'd get. And uh, not long after, <coughs> after I was there, they asked for volunteers to be flight leaders at a P-38 outfit in Long, Long Beach. Uh-huh. Or actually, 
in Los Angeles, and uh, it was a outfit that formed with flying sergeants, and uh, they had <clears throat> command and control problems. They were buzzing everything, and there were Auburn airplanes in. Who the sergeants? Yeah. I thought those were usually pretty good, good pilots. Well, they were young kids. That's the problem. They were oh. 18 years old. And, so, and it was sergeants? Yeah, flying sergeants. They you went leave. through a program. They were selected. They didn't have the, the two-year requirement to be officers, so they, they uh, started the flying sergeant program and, and contemporary with us going through flight school. But Anyway, Los Angeles was, they had guys looping off the deck and going straight into the streets and oh everything. Anyway, they called, they said, we want someone to volunteer for, to go to, down there to be flight leaders, and no one raised their hand or something. So it's just a little sailing, and I raised my hand. I'll go. I knew I'd never be flight leader, ever in that outfit. Yeah. And the Army shouldn't have done that. They should have just picked some experienced, skilled people and sent them. But so this is down in the, back to Los Angeles? Yeah, right? back. From LAX, Hamilton. Los Angeles International. Oh, uh, what's his LAX now? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so four of us from outfit, different outfits got there and were treated like bastards looking for child support or something because they that were an affront to the commander that he was being high top. In other words, he was actually having people sent in because he was having command problems. and yeah. So nothing changed. They let the sergeants keep leading that were leading. And, and what were they flying? Trainers? No, they were flying P-38s. That's an expensive airplane. Yeah, it is. They were formed at Muroc and uh, moved to Los Angeles, and and it was uh, it was can, how can you make people on the beach duck, etc. But um, we we weren't <coughs> we weren't there very long, and we got orders to to ship out, and uh, we be, actually they had a problem because enlisted people couldn't have combat roles, they could only have support roles, and so everyone was wondering, you know, you could fly a, a transport or something in, in behind the lines, but you really the present rules, you couldn't be a flying sergeant and be in combat. And on the way over, they commissioned. Because they didn't have enough training. No, it's just the rank. The, the, uh, oh. There was a, a regulation that uh, yeah. prohibited uh, enlisted pilots from. Did these enlisted pilots ever get better? Well, it's what happened, they, on the way over, they solved it by commissioning them. Oh made them second lieutenants yeah. and uh, so anyway the we we went overseas on the Queen Mary and uh, when now this it was probably in the fall of 42 this was in the in the October yeah October of uh, 42. Okay. And uh, and we have... So where did you go from uh, New York to England or what? Yeah, it went from New York, or New York to the Firth of Clyde, which was in, up there in... in oh, Scotland. Yeah, in Scotland. Yeah. And uh, Four days out, we picked up, we went across alone, and <clears throat> four days out when we got within range where the German aircraft could cover it, we picked up flat cruisers, 
for escort, and uh, and it was an old ship that couldn't keep up with the Queen Mary. But anyway, to make a long story short, it cut in front of us, and we cut the ship in half. I know. And uh, that was a cruiser. Yeah, it was a. It was you were a, on board when it hit, huh? Right. Did it the jaw the whole Queen Mary? No, just felt a bump, and we were in a in a porthole cabin on the starboard side, and looked out of the porthole, and they were they were um, <clears throat> guts of the ship going by with steam and this and that, and and they, we went on deck, general quarters, and put on. Uh, Jackets and life jackets and all yeah. that stuff, and and Queen Mary slowed but didn't stop. And it st actually stopped. No, slowed. Slowed. But, but yeah. he was under orders not to stop. Not to for, stop. And the, the captains of Queen Mary came on the public address system and said something in his British accent, never in the history of Her Majesty's ship, the Queen Mary, has she been in such a vulnerable condition with such a valuable cargo. <laughs> but anyway, we, were, we uh, went on and, and, and got a look at the bow when we were getting off the ship. They didn't dock it. They left it out anchored and, and took us ashore in lighters. and uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> it was pretty good. The bow pretty was good bashed. The bow was crushed in from about you know yeah. fifty, sixty feet up and on down. Yeah. And uh, but they uh, filled it up with concrete, and we were actually dumping it before we got all the way out. And yeah. They brought it home to the to the Boston Navy Yard and put a new bow on it for the yeah. rest of the war. So you. Uh, you know, that's a famous story. I I know about that. Uh, uh, I hope some other Navy ships were able to pick up survivors. Yeah, but they lost 300. Yeah. They did. They stopped. The other people did pick up the survivors, but we, we couldn't stop. And yeah. They were almost out of tape on this side. In fact, hold, I think what I'll it. do is I'm going to turn it over right now. Uh, so, uh, were you kind of crammed into the uh, Queen Mary? I know a fellow that was... Well, I, and all the troops were, but we weren't. The only concession to troops in our cabin, they put a double bunk instead of a single in. So we had... Instead of two people in our cabin, oh, we had four, yeah. and that was. But it had a washroom and this and that, and, yeah. and we had one of the concession troop. We had two meals a day instead of three, and, but it was. we no. The British treated us. You know, they tried to do the officer bit, and, and we did. Uh, so we. We, we had, I have no, it was a very pleasant cruise over until... Only four days? Yeah, and it was the fifth day is when we were actually... Uh, oh, you landed on the fifth day? Yeah. Yeah. But, it, yeah, it went across at about 28 knots, something like that. And, huh. and, it, and it was, the seas weren't rough or anything. They weren't running the stabilizers on the ship because of... Yeah. It had something to do with degaussing or something. Or they something didn't like have that. stabilizers in those days. But, yeah, it had. It did? Queen Mary had had centrifugal stabilizers. Oh. Huh. But but they didn't have the kind you're talking about now. No, they that, wing out. That wings and computers and all yeah. that. No. Well, uh, in, uh, in Scotland, uh, I assume you were trucked over to some air base. Right. In, in Scotland, we went to, a, actually, we went to a place in Northern Ireland. It's called Eglandary, which was an RAF base. And uh, 
they we were supported by all by the, the RAF with, uh, with all their enlisted men and and airplanes which were because ours were being barged over and they were given some miles and master time which was their training or a little bit to get used to their flight system and air brakes and stuff and then we then we uh, were, <coughs> were given Spitfires to fly and really and we flew out of uh, we just flew harmless missions out of North Ireland. And, what was uh, it like to fly a Spitfire? Spitfire was a very nice little airplane to fly. It was. Uh, I understand it was a, uh, it just responsive and yeah, light smooth. and controlled and good flying and everything. The only thing is that we <clears throat> didn't want to fight it uh, in it. We wanted the 38, but also it had no legs. But anyway, what it was. What do you mean a, it doesn't have any legs? Well, it didn't have any range to mount to anything. So. Oh, yeah. But we uh, enjoyed it, and then when we got our 38s, we started rat racing with them, flying both of them. Yeah. And uh, I learned how to fight a Spitfire and uh, beat them. And everyone said, no, no, you can't do that, but you could. And uh, the Spitfire could. But <clears throat> they never learned what to do against 38s because they didn't have the, they didn't ever get to fly them. And, but anyway, uh, we got our airplanes barged over and they made them, put them together at, at a place called Langford Lodge, and which is right where they're having Belfast, where they're having all the, or had, it's cooled down now all the, yeah. At that time, I had no problems at all between the yeah. Catholics. And Those P-38s were brought over uh, probably in a cocoon. They had brought them over that way, and I think they brought them over in, in well, They uh, brought our crates. barge stars over yeah. on ships, and uh, but they got them there and they put them together at Langford Lodge, and we picked them up. And then we had both for a while on the base. And, and then we, after, uh, when they invaded North Africa and Torch, they, we followed along. We didn't go in the initial invasion, but we flew to Africa from England, Land's End, England ticked off uh, flight to, Oran, uh, which was an all-day flight, and uh, they had drop tanks. Yeah, we had drop tanks and just ticked off the RPM, and, and uh, <coughs> we were. You flew a cruise to preserve fuel, I guess, to make that flight. You flew around Spain. Around Spain through the through Gibraltar. And some people did land in Gibraltar that were running out of out of gas and got, we were jumped by Ju-88. <coughs> oh yeah. Tail end Charlie was shot down on the. We had a we had a escort bomber leading us, and then one A-20 bringing up the rear that was supposed to watch out for. Tail and Charlie, and he got shot down. And 138 got shot up, and uh, our squadron commander bent back and shot the Ju-88 down. So we had a. I didn't. I wasn't affected. I just heard garbage and kept ticking away. I was yeah. in the front, one of the first flights, and and uh, I wasn't affected, but we were. What We're kind done. of training did you have to uh, dogfight any German airplane? What kind of training? Yeah. Very little. <laughs> I <laughs> had a total of two gunnery missions on sleeves, air to air. Is that all? That's all. No air to air practice? No. 
Well, you did some dogfighting and stuff of your own, on your own, against the Navy and against this and that and against yourselves, but we didn't, we were under-trained. Wow. Very under-trained. And when we got to, when we started combat in Africa, we, we had, at first we had very high losses and and that's because the Germans had been flying since Spain and in Russia and this and that and we were against. But, but anyway, we, <coughs> for, for the situation which we were escorting mainly, escorting B-25s and B-24 a little bit, B-17s a little bit, but B-26s mostly and B-25, and we were always jumped by them because we had to stay with the bombers and stuff. Now, were these B-24 bombers? Pardon? Uh, were they mostly B-24s? Mostly B-25s and oh, B-26s. Oh, the, the small ones, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, <coughs> it's what we were doing, we were in the north African Strategic Air Force, which was, which was meaning meaning we were, we were not supporting the close air support troops and the Romel and stuff. This is all within North Africa. You didn't right. cross the Mediterranean. Yeah, either. we were crossing the Mediterranean. To you Sicily were crossing the Mediterranean. Sardinia and Sicily. Where most of our missions were out over the Mediterranean. Right. And All right. So flying from North Africa to Sicily and and, and southern, Sardinia, southern Italy. Yeah. Ah, oh. uh, this this is the twelfth Air Force you were in. Twelfth Air Force before it became the fifteenth. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was the North African Strategic Air Force. Okay. Yeah, and the uh, was it? We uh, were intercepting ships. And uh, Ju, their transport Ju-52s, and uh, Italian SM-82s, and transports and stuff, and they were all escorted by 109s and 190s. And stuff. Yeah. Stuff. So did you? Uh, now this was about the beginning of of uh, seventy of uh, forty three then. Yes, that's true. Right. Beginning about forward. January, or somewhere in there. January, February, March. Yeah. Yeah. Up till. Did you ever, ever, ever shoot down any aircraft? Yes, I. I have. Uh, I shot down. Um, uh, One o nine on a mission that was. I was a skip bomber, on a ship that I was able to throw bombs into and he got through the top cover and I shot him down as I was pulling off the ship. And on another mission I shot down three aircraft that were two SM-82s, which was an Italian transport. And again a, a 109 got through the top cover. Yeah. And I shot him down head on also. You didn't want to Shoot! You didn't want to attack a 38 head-on. They learned late, later, because we had very good firepower in the nose. Yeah, it was all in the nose. Yeah, you just just had to steer. It was all come. Yeah. It was yeah. All. And then, then later, <coughs> my my wingman and I were were escorting B-25s over raid in, in, in Sardinia and, and uh, I got a uh, deflection shot off a off, uh, German coming in attacking the bombers and uh, my guns jammed and I had no, <coughs> no, uh, no guns period so my wingman took the lead and and we started for home and we got caught by three 109s that were diving at us from the rear. 
and uh, they were starting, they had self-destroying ammo that you could see, the flak breaking, and so I told him to go back, bend back into them, and he, we turned, we, we did, we made a, a, a turn, came, and just in one 360 turn, we got on their fanny, and he fired at one and missed, and he hit one, and, and shot it down, and I was on the third one with no ammo and just sitting back behind him. And yeah. of course he didn't know I had no ammo. And he broke one way and I broke the other. But my wingman, that was his second plane that day and he became an ace off my wing and I, yeah. I got mad. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had four and he had five. But anyway, anyway, it was, we found out that <coughs> cannon plug on my to make the cannon work, the trigger they hadn't connected it. Was you had twenty. You had twenty millimeter cannon on you. One twenty and four fifties. Yeah. Okay, and they. And jam. then my ammo got turned over in the dogfight in the cans and jammed oh. the, the four fifties. So I had zero. But anyway, that was that wasn't very a good deal for me. But Did you ever get a fist? Okay. Never got a fifth. He kept trying. <laughs> I kept, later on I went, I got a fighter bomber outfit in Korea, F-86s, but they, they threatened us with our life if we, if, if we, uh, yeah. if, if we went north and dropped our bombs and played Russian or MiG, MiG killers instead of bomber pilots. So. But anyway, that was just fate. That's the big one that counted. Yeah. Was the fifth one. I understand one of the advantages of a P-38 is that you could outturn a 109 by just chopping one engine, and and the other one pull you around. Well, that that adverse yawn type is better to to try to make a guy aim wrong. In other words, you're slewed and he's thinking that you're going to do a, a deal. The, the 38 would out turn a 109 without that. And uh, I never used them in combat, but it had combat flaps, which whenever you're a rat racing for fun or just to some other, like a Spitfire or something, you used them, and it had the 52-foot wingspan and combat flaps. It had, it would really turn, and you could outturn people. People all ballyhooed you, but it would outturn, turn a, a Spitfire, and we learned that in in by flying Spitz ourselves and how to do it. And after the Axis quit in North Africa, after we beat them, they were given four days of, of like rest and our airplanes, and we flew around up to the bad guys' um, <coughs> bases, had been the bad guys' bases. and Made the Germans. Yeah, I went to Bizerta, which had been a hot spot. We hated it flying. And Bizerta I went, in Italy? No, in, in North Africa. Oh, in North Africa. And I went with my flight. I took my flight sightseeing, and we landed there, and they had 109s and 190s there on the base, but it was all mine, and they kicked us out of there. And, and so I, I took off, and didn't know where I was going to go, but I, a lone Spitfire showed up and I, I rocked my wings and he moved in and I gave him the, the signal of we'd like some fuel or something and he rocked his wings. We couldn't talk to him, but he followed him and, and so he led us to a, what it was a British Spitfire base and he was the, the wing commander. 
and he invited us to lunch and so they had I still remember they had a tent with a Persian rug and they had a piano with a with one a grand piano but it had a one box under one one uh, leg but it was there and they, we were having lunch and they had the the white apron servers and you know, first class type deal and, yeah and we're and they said uh, they'd looked at the airplane sitting there on the ground so they started maligning it and they said did you ever fly to 110 which was a german twin engine fighter which they knew it was a dog, and and so we said, "Oh yeah, we fought it." And then my wingman kept saying, "Hey, you, know, why don't you tell them that you can beat a Spitfire?" And they, oh, you can't beat a Spitfire. So anyway, this <coughs> the wing commander had invited a, a Yank over the to have lunch with us and he flew in with a Spit 9. His name was Lance Wade. And Lance Wade was the ace of the African campaign. He had 23 victories. An American that wouldn't go back into the into our service for some reason when they were, you know. He was an American flying for the British. American Brits. flying for the British. Now this, you flew, you followed the Spit into the uh, a British airdrome. Then. Yeah, and that's when you with the P thirty eight, right? Yeah, and and, and the, then he invited this guy over and delayed lunch until he got there, and uh, so anyway, to make a long story short, we we decided that we'd go at each other, and uh, on the so I dropped my tanks, empty tanks, and the Brits arms and we took off opposite each other on the on this uh, dirt strip and went at it and he's flying a spit he's, he's flying a spit and I'm flying a 38 and we're and we're and he I got on his tail and right right and later on he said well you right me once you right me twice meaning I got lead on him and Stuff. And then I joined up, he said, but then when we got together, he said, I think I was faster than you, and I was riding his wing before we landed. But anyway, all these Brits of the crowd were, they, yeah. they knew, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> that damn 38 did outturn during yeah. Lance Wade, who was the biggest, the ace of the African campaign. And you were all at 22 at that time. I was a big. 20, 24 by that time, 23, 20, 20, big 23 years old. Yeah, he just turned 23. Yeah, but anyway, Lance then wasn't around later when I got to to challenge a, a deal in the paper years later, and he got killed on a Spitfire in, in, in Italy, but there's plenty of people on the ground that knew it happened, and of course my wingmen all knew it happened. <laughs> but anyway, was he got killed in an accident? Yeah, on t yeah, the airplane blew up on him. So a Spitfire yeah. blew up on him. Right. But wow. Yeah. But anyway, the that was the that was the uh, is all a Spitfire had to do was like a split S or. This and, that, and the 38 couldn't follow it, and, but no, we knew it, but they didn't know it. So, in other words, you duck, duck under, and, and uh, a 38 would, as you knew in the early days, it hit compressibility fast, and it would black out the tail and it would buff it, and, yeah. and and the Spitfires could do a, they could, they could roll over and do a split S at low altitude and get away with it, and yeah. And uh, they could, and it was a turn machine too. But they were single engine and getting our wash, and it'd flop all over. And frankly, it gets a little bit chicken as what happened. And but but we grind around with those 
with combat flaps, which I never used in combat, but you used like I used that day. Now the idea of the flaps is you could... It extends, it's a Fowler flap and extends and makes a bigger... Wind, a bigger, wind, air, air, bigger area of lift. So, uh, yeah, a lift. Yeah. You, they came down on both sides. They, yeah, they came down both sides. And they came on a track extended out back of the of the wing. Of, and Of the fuselage. Right. Between, of the wing. The, between the booms. Yeah, on the wing. Uh, between the booms. Yeah. Though. Between the booms on the wing. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it just made a bigger lifter lifting area and 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 of course grinding around with the two two uh, Allisons going wide open they gave you pretty good and you're stable, so you had you had a lot of visibility from that cockpit. It was you? a good visibility. It, didn't have such good down because you're mid wing, but it had good visibility. And, and did you uh, have trouble seeing one oh nines? I've flown in small airplanes enough to realize, boy, there's a airplane could be nearby and you have trouble seeing it. Well, uh, yeah, you use. Ever since World War One, <laughs> you used the sun, and you used you tried to tried for the guys not to see you. The guy who's going to get you is one that you don't see. So yeah, the fighter pilot's main thing is next on a swivel. So you had a rear view mirror, didn't you? No, he, he didn't have a rear view mirror. It didn't do any good if you did that. Oh. No, you have to really look. So. You had to have a swivel neck. Yeah, yeah, which which <laughs> I used to have. I don't anymore. <laughs> but yeah, no, you just have to. Uh, yeah, you have to keep your head out of your, you know, fanny. So. Yeah. But uh, the uh, did you think the one hundred nine was a pretty good aircraft? No, the 109 was a good airplane, but the 109 was also a, had been in service a long time, and and they built thousands of them. But they the their better airplane was the 190. The Falkwolf 190 was more of a challenge for us. Yeah, but. At the time that we were fighting the war, the 109 was the airplane that they, we mostly went, went against it. Now you did all the, you're flying out of, off of Africa, uh, throughout the northern part of Africa, and then over to Sicily and Italy, just in that one area, which was quite extensive. And the, the Germans were, uh, had they uh, evacuated uh, North Africa by that time? They they evacuated. They were beaten in North Africa in 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 early uh, early June or May, right? Right about then. Forty one or forty two. Of of. Uh, Forty-three. Forty-three. Yeah, and that was when, when Rommel was beaten, and and uh, Montgomery was, you know, the big war hero yeah. for, for for the time, and that was I was shot down in the fifteenth of June forty-three at the African. Campaign was over, and we were going into Sicily, flying in to soften up targets for the invasion, which happened in about a, a couple of weeks later after I shot down. Now, why, why did you go around getting shot down for? Because you were doing okay. Because I got shot down by Flack. No, no fighter pilot was ever going to shoot me down. <laughs> But some dumb Italian misjudged and hit me with a 
An Italian shot you down. Yeah, you know, with a, about a 40 millimeter ACAC gun. And that's what happened. We got this mission to go to Sicily on an early suppression of a radar station. Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, this is important here. I want to back up just a bit here. This is tape two of an uh, interview with uh, Richard Kenny uh, talking about his North African uh, flying a P-38. Uh, date is the 16th of uh, May 2007. My name is Bob Wright. Uh, listen, could we go back just to cover it better? Uh, you, what base were you flying out of North Africa to go to Sicily, Sicily when you were shot down? Well, <clears throat> flying out of Tafarui, which is just a near, desert. Near Alexandria? It's, it's in Tunisia. And it's uh, and what's the the name of it again? Well, Tafarui. You know the spelling offhand? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, actually, we just moved, and and we're a brand new base, and um, we. Uh, <clears throat> I was. Actually, it's what what happened. I, I was. We were tasked to to uh, go suppress uh, the uh, defenses around an early radar station in, in Sicily that the B-25s were going to come over and bomb later that day. And uh, I was uh, acting operations officer and I was scheduled in the flights. And so I took the last flight there we had 12 airplanes three flights and i knew the last one would be the one that we woke them up and all that kind of stuff oh you were you and were was being more dumb. vulnerable pardon you were vulnerable right and i being dumb at the time i i was being more than nice and uh, i scheduled myself for the last flight <clears throat> knowing that we had a chance that was the worst position. Well, yet. you wouldn't. Well, you were a second, first lieutenant by then. I'm no, sure. No, I was still a second lieutenant. Yeah, and but. Uh, but I was operations officer because. Well, you wouldn't want anybody else. You wouldn't want to have it on your conscience to have somebody else there. Well, I would now, <laughs> <laughs> but but then I was invulnerable. So, but anyway, I took the first flight, and we did wake them up going in, and they started shooting. They hit two of us, but only me. I was the only one that was. I got hit in the left engine, and and I dove down to the deck and feathered the, the bad engine that was hit, and. And I, it was burning. I couldn't get the fire out, and it started burning in the cockpit. And, and I knew I couldn't make the Mediterranean, so I, I, I took bit the bullet and pulled the throttle back, and de and I belted in on the on the coast of Sicily, and you know. It didn't. You didn't up for jumping. No, no, I was too low. I was afraid to pull up. Well, first thing, the 38, you didn't bail up very good on it because of the tail. Yeah. Boom, boom across. But at low altitude, you, yeah, naturally. you wouldn't have had any chance. And besides that, that hit you better if you pulled up. So <clears throat> anyway, I, I had to belly it in, and it, it was fully engulfed in flames and oh boy I got out of it and ran and uh, <coughs> the uh, in the not too far away uh, there was a 
house, like a adobe type house, and the lady was there, and I <laughs> ran, and she brought me inside and <coughs> started. You were burned, I think. dabbing olive oil on my arms. I was, yeah, I was burned. You burned on your arms and your face. Yeah, right? and, and leg. And leg. I was burned pretty badly, and and uh, so. <coughs> I was inside there, and I was trying to get help. And, and of course, and about that time, the bombers came over and they unloaded. And <laughs> I still remembered seeing the the beam, the beam squirting or <clears throat> dust squirting out from the like a flea powder bomb, the, the old-fashioned. Flea powder bomb used to squeeze, and, and uh, all the <coughs> the little shack was the spouting was, out. The building was shaking. Yeah, it was shaking, and this and that. And then, just about the bomb had stopped, and the door opened, and I tell you, and <coughs> she covered Dunn, with you with olive oil. Well, she that. was dabbing and crying and put olive oil on my arms and stuff. She was doing the best she could, but they, anyway, how, old a, how old a woman was she? Oh, she must have been in her mid-forties. Yeah. Not, nothing that you would yeah. try to take to the dance, but anyway, I got picked up by the gendarmes. And now, these were Italian troops? Italian troops, yeah. They <clears throat> put me in a in a car and took me to a hospital in Palermo, and uh, in Paloma. In Palermo, yeah, Paloma, yeah. and uh, the hospital, courtesy of us, had no running water and, and lights only at certain times, and and uh, <clears throat> they. Took me in there, and the, but the Italian doctors. I I, I went in, into this room, and it smelled, and and there was a British soldier there that had an amputated leg, and he had it had gangrene, and oh boy, and he was in really bad shape, and, and this this. Brett told me, he said, tell him you're a Catholic, you'll get better treatment. I didn't tell him anything, but he did. And uh, <coughs> I couldn't do the cross business or anything. So He's told you, anyway, to, they, he told you uh, to tell you, say what? He said, tell him you're a Catholic. Oh, Catholic? You yeah, and they'll treatment? give you better treatment. Oh, okay, because you're so, an Italian. Yeah. Yeah, good and, deal. Yeah, and so the doctor's there, and... And I said, hey, I don't want you to treat me until you treat that guy. The, the, yeah. And, and they actually did. They rebanded just filthy bandages and stuff. And, yeah. And they, and they had, uh, they didn't have very good, they had paper bandages and stuff. It was a pretty bad situation, but anyway, they, they did the best they could, and, and that. <clears throat> Were you wearing uh, a coverall? Yeah, a wearing a flight suit. Flight yeah. suit and a le leather jacket too. So. You had that. It was. It came from your chest down to your legs, and on a flight jacket. That no, I had a whole flight suit with like coveralls. Like coveralls. Okay. Yeah, you wore the. And did you have? Uh, uh, Boot, boots, boots or low boots, quarters? Boots, flying boot, boots, okay. and gloves, but they were burned. Yeah. And uh, and the leather jacket was all sensed. And, and uh, the next day, a German came and told the Italian doctor, "I'm taking him." And the German, the, the Italian doctor said. No, you can't take me. You can't even. He's too 
too injured. You can't take him. And the Germans called him a swan and swine. And, you know, I, and I knew enough to my Spanish and this and that. And everyone knew what swan was. So, but anyway, so he tried to get me up, and I passed out for him good. And so he told us I tell him they'd be back the next day with a litter to you know and to yeah. take me away and and uh, so the uh, that night a little sausage came it was meticulous with a little goatee yeah and he came into the ward and brought me some some lemons or something and, and this and that and he said when are the Americans coming I can't stand the oppression and stuff and so I asked him I said well get me out of here and I'll help you when they come out and he said no I'd be shot if if I was found in here now so so anyway uh, this is the doctor asking this is the Italian the Italian uh, doctor. Sicilian. No, the Sicilian. Oh, Sicilian. Uh, like a burgermeister, like the head of the town. town. Yeah. And he was saying, when are the Americans coming? We, you know, we can't stand the oppression and all yeah. the German Germans treated them like, like, you know, really, they had no respect at all. For yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, but the German did came back the next day and with a, a litter and enlisted men and took took me, Shanghai me out of there. I think the reason that they wanted American prisoners, they lost so many in Africa that I think even gathering up the crippled ones and the hurt ones was. Did they want to uh, uh, interrogate you? Well, <clears throat> not then. No, but later. Uh, yeah. yeah, but they, they, uh, that, at that time they took me to the coast and put me on what's equivalent of a landing barge and took me across the Straits of Messina to Italy and then put me on a train with a escort, a little, a young Lieutenant, on Army Lieutenant, and some four or five enlisted men, and 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 uh, sent me to 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 Rome, and uh, and when I got to Rome, he gave me off to <coughs> plain clothesman. He was happy to get rid of me, <laughs> and yeah. he gave me the plain clothesman. That I'm sure were Gestapo types, and they took me to a to a high-rise building that proved to be a hospital, and <clears throat> gave me better treatment, better medical treatment, and uh, bandaged my my arms and stuff, and and <clears throat> I thought, well, this is be better deal. And then I saw a British Red Cross on the on the so they waited until they had Red Cross supplies to to use on this prisoner. But anyway, they did. That's the first time they tried to interrogate me. And then they they said, uh, "Well, tell us what your outfit is, and we'll try to send you to a camp with your same buddies and stuff." And and I said, "Well, I'll take my chances." And so. Wait a minute, you lost me there. They, they <coughs> yeah, were in the, the hospital and they, they were going to ship you somewhere? No, they said, if you'll tell us who you're, what outfit you're in stuff, we'll send you to the camp with your present other people that yeah. you know, in other words. Yeah. And I <coughs> I was playing this name right serial number stuff, so I said I'd take my chances and sure so the next day I'm on a on a train <coughs> going north and I I'm going 
the only thing was <clears throat> I did have, they gave me a, a German officer who was accompanying me, you know, that was my guardian angel watching out and making sure I had. Could you get up and walk? I could walk, but I, I couldn't. My arms were bent. I couldn't use my hands. How about your feet and face? No, I could. I could. Well, I was just. No, I was just burned. I wasn't. I I was I was ambulatory. I could okay. walk. But anyway, we went to the train, and they had a Red Cross car, white linen and all that, and I thought, oh, that's what I won't need, and. Uh, person in charge of it wouldn't let us on because this lieutenant, would, I think it was all an act, but anyway, they wouldn't let us on because he was armed and stuff, and I was able to get across to him, well, what if he didn't have his weapon, would would you then let us on the Red Cross car? And, and they said, yeah, so anyway, it was a then I did get on the, the car with the, with the, you know, the Red Cross car with the white sheets and the attendants and stuff, because I couldn't even wipe, you know, but it was, uh, so anyway, we, we started chugged off there and we going up and, and we go through the Brenner Pass and, and we're, and we go into Switzerland on part of the ride, and they come and don't say anything. You, know, you were sitting in a chair so you could look out the window, I take it? No, <laughs> I was laying in a bed. Oh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, we're <clears throat> the Italians, I mean, the Swiss just let them take you through. They didn't challenge them, hey, you can't take a prisoner of war, and blah, blah, blah. But they, they, since they were surrounded and this and that, you never, there's all kinds of stories about the Switzerland. But they were building, like they had arms factories going for the Germans and this and that. But, yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, they, I went, I ended up at a place called <coughs> Dulag Luft, and Dulag Luft was a German interrogation center, and uh, and I got <coughs> off the train, and they brought me to the this ho hospital that had white sheets and this and nurses and man. And uh, so I'm. You still in your white in your flight suit? Yeah, that's I. I still in my flight suit. Yeah, but but uh, they. Uh, but you're you're being treated in the hospital. In other words, like you should when you're injured. And so after I think it was probably two days or something. Uh, the guy in a suit comes in and he says, I'm from the Red Cross. Now if you give me your name, rank, so bomb load and type airplane. <laughs> you know, a phony Red Cross guy. And so then I'm non cooperative. So the next day I'm in a in a cell with a shaving palliass, uh for a mattress and no windows and a boarded up window and in a in a interrogation center and sent for by the uh, a captain that's the interrogation officer and and uh, pretty much on a on a bread and water like diet thin cabbage soup and and this and that, and, and and interrogated by the this captain that's uh, that I'm <clears throat> by daily it gets 
In other words, I was pulling the name, rank, and serial number, which I fully agree is ridiculous, but that's how the law is. And that's how. The well, what, what else? What else would you say? Well, I just he'd tell me, ask me questions, and I'd just say I can't answer that. You know, I'm. This is all I'm. I'm lieutenant so and so, and <laughs> rank serial number, and that's it. And are you from California? What city are you from? Or no, which is absolutely stupid. In other words, you could tell him where you were. No, from. no, you didn't, I didn't tell him anything. Yeah. And. Uh, but you feel you could have. Well, no, I, I know you. I could have, and later on you filled out when you got to prison. You had filled out a card for the compound and had all your where you're from and address and. You had to for send parcels Cro back but, and forth. And but this is the, for the Red Cross purposes. Yeah, but this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, this was baloney, and the, he was a, there, it's all right at camp, but this was at an interrogation center. Yeah. And, and uh, so anyway, this guy finally gets disgusted with me, and he says, uh, well, you'll want to send for me. I won't send for you anymore. And uh, a little corpsman came in to, and he would dress my bandages and stuff, and and he he was a pretty decent little kid, and he'd take Horlex like malted milk tablets and and wrap them in my bandages where you could mouth one out yeah. now and then if you thought you were gonna die, and of course he would have been disciplined if they caught yeah. him, I think, but. He did it, and, but anyway, finally, after after a couple of weeks of solitary, they, he sent for me again, and and uh, they had a the British had told us about interrogations and stuff. They said, well, sometimes they even watch your eyes and reaction in front of a map and watch you do this and that, so. I was trying to, I was reading this map backwards to try to, you know, and I looked and there's three red pins on it in Sicily. And I said, we invaded Sicily. The guy, he got ballistic. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> shout out of here, you know. <laughs> so anyway, back to the cell. And I yelled everybody going down the, the thing other prisoners, and you never saw them, but they're in, so we invaded Sicily, we invaded Sicily. So anyway, then he calls me for me again, and and uh, an entirely different attitude, and he says, well, he says, I'm going to send you to camp, I'm vouching for you. See, they take your dog tags away and everything, and all your identification then said, you're a Russian, or you're this or that. And so he said, you've acted like an officer, so I'm going to vouch for you and I'm going to send you to camp and everything. He says, you know, I was only trying to do my job. In other words, he was... Yeah, this is a German officer. Yeah, and this is two years, yeah. German yeah. officer that has been interrogating me all the time, held a <clears throat> pistol to my head at one time. And oh, yeah? Yeah, he did all his junk and told me how that he, Churchill had a had a bounty on him because he let a prisoner escape and shot him and a bunch of all that stuff. Yeah. And of course, I was just, I looked around and figured, well, it wasn't very bloody in this office, but you never knew, you know, so. Yeah. But anyway, he said something about, I said, who's going to win this war? And he says, well, we both know that. And I, I said, how long? This is about two years. He was pretty much right. But this is the last day. Yeah. And the next day, I'm on a train for, for Stalag Bluff Three, and in, in, in uh, you know, a friend of mine, he was uh, uh, a navigator on a B-24. He was 21, 20, 20 years old, 21, and he he uh, parachuted out and was captured and he was interrogated and the uh, uh, he wouldn't it was name rank serial business yeah. and in the, the this 
uh, officer says, that's okay, we know all about you. He yeah. goes over a file yeah. and he's got all uh, his whole high school. No, they knew, they had newspaper clubs about me, but I just looked at them and so uh, but they yeah, did? They, they had newspaper clippings yeah. on them? They had they a pretty them? good intelligence what going they... on. We had all kinds of people from the state send them junk and everything. To the, to the Germans? Yeah. To this the, isn't through yeah, the Red Cross? Clandestine. No, not the Red Cross. Just plain their intelligence system. They, they had, they knew, they knew what class you're in. The only thing they didn't know about me was an obvious thing they should have known. In the, from the time they picked me up to where they interrogated me, they'd lost track of what I was flying. And yeah. they were desperate to know what I was flying. You mean like the P-38? Yeah. yeah. And of course, everyone knew I was flying a P-38. <laughs> so, but yeah. anyway, it was, uh, then it's funny, but they still are talking about name rank, serial number and stuff. And, and yeah. they'll let you get beat the hell out of you for no reason at all. There's no reason that you can't be civil. And there's no reason that, that if you know about A-bombs or something that you don't know enough to keep quiet about them, you know? Yeah. In other words, I was a lousy second lieutenant. They should have, I didn't know anything, let's face it. <laughs> but it was still name rank and serial number. So, and date yeah. of birth, you can give them that. But, so I don't know how much you want to go into. Uh, there I am in prison again. <laughs> yeah, hold it one second. Yeah. Uh, I want to look at something here. I can't tell too well. Yeah, we could, oh, it's still gone. I'm sorry. I moved the camera. I thought I turned. I thought I turned it off. Turned off the wrong thing. Uh, yeah, we could go into the camp thing and uh, for a few minutes here. With us, you went to uh, uh, Stalag Three. Luff Three. Luff Three. Yeah, Luft is the air air force. Yeah. The the. The Luftwaffe, so that's why it's Luft three. Yeah. And then Stalag, regular one with the army and stuff. We ended up in, in, the Stalag. School. Near what city was that camp? That was in, in Saigon, like Saigon. 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 It's on, it's ninety miles northeast of Berlin on the Oder River. Okay. Stalag Love Three, and it's made famous by the Great Escape movie. Did that really happen? Yes, I was, I was in, uh, I was in the center camp, which was the British camp, and uh, that's where they dug the tunnels and stuff. And just before that, they were so American. Our numbers were increasing. And they started another camp adjacent to that camp. And uh, it was called the South Camp. And they uh, moved all the Americans into that camp. Yeah. And some of the Americans had worked on the tunnel and were entitled to get out. Yeah. So that night before they broke the tunnel, they cut hold the fence the prisoners, and we shuffled people around back and forth. And of course, they took the most likely to be able to to make it by German speakers or worked on the tunnel or, or and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they, uh, and of course, they broke out the tunnel and, and they, Next day, the Germans were made us go stand a pal there and to get straight who broke out and this and that. And they they and wanted a body count. Yeah. 
Yeah. They emptied the barracks and made us stand out in the parade ground and they went through them and still cigarettes and the, the chocolate bars and all the other junk. But <clears throat> but anyway, we stood there all day while they counted. But the story is pretty well right. They did, but they did, they shot 50 guys. They're all British, so they didn't shoot any Americans, and whether that's just they're afraid to or why or what, I, I don't know. But you mean after they captured him? Yeah. Yeah. And they actually executed him? Yes. Yeah. And they executed him. They thought it would stop us from digging tunnels, and of course it didn't, but, but it, it was more or less something to do. They, they, uh, Prisoners were pretty ingenious, and it's like the Mexicans digging tunnels across the border. But it's a lot of work and everything to do it, and and to hide the entrance way and to hide the dirt, and uh, <clears throat> and. Were you involved with any of the digging? No, I was. I was a lookout. And, uh, I was. I was still in bandages and stuff during that area, yeah. that period of time. But we had systems to, they had called ferrets that would run around the camp all day and all night. And when you saw them, you'd signal to the other people in the next barracks and stuff by closing the shutter or some other signal. And uh, uh, a ferret was a German. Pardon? A ferret was a German. Yeah. So you could spot Crawler. who they were. They could crawl around under the barracks, and, oh. and uh, our barracks were all built on stilts, like up yeah. about three feet. And, and this is why it was pretty hard for the tunnel. They had to use some real ingenuity and everything to uh, to cut out concrete place where the stoves were. And, That's a good story. So, uh, was there ever any, do uh, you think there were any Americans that uh, uh, would squeal on the guys? I, I really don't believe so. They, they, uh, they would have been some pretty harsh treatment. <laughs> yeah. You hear some movies about showing Showing people did, but there were no, there would have been no advantages and and yeah. uh, nothing. But anyway, we, our caliber, we had mostly officers in our camp. We had very few enlisted. And some we did have some that were worked in the cookhouse and yeah. and and uh, did some other jobs. But I I never heard of any and and, yeah. and the most of the well they were all as I say <coughs> officers and we did have very few ground officers. We had some but our camp was a luff camp so it was for flyers. What was a uh, an average day? Uh, they uh, what time would be Reveille or in the morning. Well, probably 6.30 or something. Did they blow a big bugle or something like that? Well, they, they had, yeah, they, they had a loudspeaker system. You know, oh, okay. And they, they'd call a, a pal. In English or German? In, in English, but we got, I mean, Certain things are got to be common that we call like the prisoners we call Kriegis more than more than anything else because that's a German word for prisoner. Yeah, you you pick up the words after a while. Yeah, and, and uh, but we uh, uh, then 
Then uh, you got you were counted, I assume. Yeah, you went out on the parade ground and by blocks by your organization and and uh, by blocks and and uh, they they counted you and and. And while you're out there, a lot of times they went through the barracks and used it for excuse to, to you know, to... What did, what did they, then they would have a, a breakfast? Well... Steak and eggs and yeah, toast? You got... When we were on what you call full parcels, which was Red Cross parcels, they were about a shoebox size, <clears throat> and uh, they were sent from Switzerland, and and they were provided by Canada, England, and the U.S. And so there were three type parcels, and uh, <clears throat> they had in them oatmeal and and sugar and coffee or tea and and uh, this and that and but mainly in breakfast you might if you had full parcels you got maybe oatmeal or a slice of to the Germans provide certain black bread. Wait, hold it one second. Okay. Uh, the uh, well, anyway breakfast amounted to what if you're lucky, or as I say, you were on parcels, and you had some oatmeal, and and you had they had a <coughs> powdered milk, so you could make make some kind of they called Klim milk spelled backwards, but you could make uh, milk and have oatmeal, or sometimes you had <coughs> you could toast. Uh, um, the black bread that the Germans gave you on a certain ration of it. And <clears throat> you could toast it on the top of the cook stove, and, uh, which is a coal stove for heat. And then you did your, your what cooking you could do on it. And, uh, <clears throat> and some jelly from either their, theirs, which wasn't very much, or the jams that, that came in the parcels, and we we let we shared the parcels so that American parcels went to Brits and their parcels went to us, and the Canadians the same way, and uh, <coughs> they all had various things, and, and the Canadians one of the things they had that everyone wanted was they had canned bacon that, that uh, Canadian bacon? No, it was regular bacon oh. wrapped with a paper wrapping and in a can and no, it would have been good to have Canadian bacon but but uh, that was <clears throat> that was one of the things and, and uh, they had canned butter and ours had canned marge, and their butter was better than our marge. And uh, so the British had tea, and and we did make tea in the middle of the day usually. And and uh, but anyway, the uh, the food that was the you never had enough to eat. Let's face it, you're young kids. And, and, uh, How much weight did you did you lose? I, I got down. I don't know exactly how much I lost, but I got down to about a hundred and thirty pounds. And, and uh, from what you must have weighed? Probably one hundred sixty-five or seventy. But so you lost about thirty pounds or so. Forty. Pounds. Yeah, I think that's probably about right. Yeah. But. Um, that's what the day was, was really surviving, you just... Did you play games, or were you bored, or... It well, seemed like yeah. day after day it was the same sameness. Well, 
we we ended up with a pretty good library with books sent in and the Red Cross brought them in. Red Cross brought them in and and uh, we even got some from the Germans and stuff and and uh, <clears throat> we had just surviving with doing laundry and this and that uh, was I knew you were, you might be bored but you had plenty of of work to do. In other yeah. words, uh, listen, uh, excuse me, I think I'm going to change this tape right now. Uh, well, it's sort of uh, a dark, overcast day anyway. So, ah, uh, so you you did a lot of reading. Yeah, you you read. We actually had classes, and oh. we we other people. I didn't ever do it, but we had drama. And they gave on plays. They had musicians, and they had a band, and on the 4th of July we had a rat rodeo and this and that. that. Pretty, that many people, there was a lot of time in their hands, had, were pretty, pretty uh, ingenious. We had a lot of, a lot of people made uh, you know, or clothes for escape, and and uh, we had a watchmaker, the, we had a barber, and uh, huh. all people. The, the commodity was cigarettes or chocolate bars, and once in a while, soap thrown in, and uh, you. They had a little store set up, light, and you could barter for this or that. And, uh, the guys that would get into fights? No, no. That, get on each other's nerve? Oh, probably, but you just went and found a hole in the wall or something if you... Yeah. Nobody... Every, everyone pretty well got along. You're all in the same boat. And, yeah. And uh, so it was... You're all looking forward to one thing, winning the war and get the hell out of there, but... Now this, this kept up for you for two solid years. Well, it's what... What happened, you know, was I was one of the... Yeah, you know, I was a pretty early prisoner and I was there... I invaded a lot before D-Day, yeah. But uh, the... Uh, and another skip forward to that pr prison camp, and then April 29th, um, 45. 45, we heard guns from the Eastern Front, or we'd been hearing guns. Yeah. And the Germans had threatened to move us. We thought they wouldn't be able to. We thought we'd probably be liberated by the Germans. And by the Russians? I mean by the Russians, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did yeah, you, before I forget it, did you have... Yeah, by the Germans, yeah. During those two years, did yeah. you have any outside news of how the yeah. war was progressing? Yes, we did. We listened to BBC. And did somebody rigged up a radio? A receiver? You know, we had radios that clandestine they were sent in in parts and assembled and and every day certain people were in charge of the news and would come around to, and brief everyone yeah. in the barracks of that day's news. And we had a newspaper that we made ourselves and uh, it had uh, just general general stuff, but no no war news. Uh, but yeah. we did, we kept up and we knew what was happening on the, on the news. And uh, we uh, we knew the invasion, we knew, and we knew the bombing, and we knew, we, we knew, and then we had German propaganda, so. Oh yeah. We knew that. But no, 
<coughs> we were, we had, uh, we had clandestine two-way communications. Actually, we, we could also, we could also put out some information, and uh, to the authorities at times, but we. Uh, at when we w were given, we were given 30 minutes notice that they were going to move us. Because you could hear the, the Russian well, we, artillery. Well, we could hear the Russian coming. We didn't know how far we figured. And then we heard they were at Breslau or something, which was about 20 miles away. But the Germans said, all right, you have 30 minutes to leave. All right. But we'd been sort of making backpacks and out of trousers, and we'd been making sleds, and we'd been making all this stuff. We'd been hoarding food, and because uh, we pretty well knew that we were going to either be liberated or, mo or, or moved. And, Anyway, 30 minutes to move, and it was snowing, and like hell, and it was late at night, and it was freezing, and 30 minutes. And so we put our junk together and formed up, and, and sure as hell, we started out walking away from the camp. And the walking one, west. Yeah, walk, yeah, southwest, yeah. And one thing that we did, though, we lit the barracks on fire with the, with our cigarette hoard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't, we didn't, want, we wanted to leave scorched earth. <laughs> and we had the German guards. Well, first there were rumors that if you fell out, they were going to shoot you, which wasn't right. They had. They had uh, <coughs> some horse-drawn carts, and they they picked up some stragglers and stuff. And and the German guards were in sad shape as we were. There were a bunch of old guys walking around with us and uh, carrying rifle, and, and uh, we it was really miserable. We. We, you know, you didn't have rain, good snow gear, rain gear, and you'd taken your boots and dabbed them with, with grease and and larger and stuff to try to make them waterproof, and and uh, we'd been issued uh, uh, <coughs> overcoats, trench, and we'd we'd cut the skirts off them a lot of times and made a, a hood like a sweatshirt with the yeah. kids or, and would would modify everything as best we could. And Were these German overcoats or American? No, U.S. American ones. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, anyway, we toddled out of there along about t 2,000 of us and uh, and the people carrying the goods got up front, got too heavy in us, and then they started discarding. Now I was pretty much in the rear, and we started living off other people's throwaways for a while. And, and after about three nights, I think it was, we they took us and put us in a in a German blast factory that had big oven-like furnaces that were still warm and they had much you for three days. Yeah, three days, night and day. Yeah. Okay. The, they did. The first good food we got was one parade ground. They marched us in. The Germans had set up a field kitchen, and we got hot soup. And about the second day or third day or I've, I've lost it by now. I have notes and stuff, but it's yeah. not important. But it's it. We finally got some hot food, and we 
and we got to to bed down this glass factory, which was warm, and we were able to dry our clothes and this kind of stuff. And then we marched some more, and and then the fourth day, we we got to a a train station and and they put us on in cattle car, you know, these forty by eight cars that had been pretty well fouled with cattle or horses or something before, just shoved you in uh, n no no latrines of any kind or anything and but <laughs> they were able to train us out of there and, and uh, south. And after about a day, they stopped in a big field and let you out to relieve yourself and stuff. And, and uh, But we still didn't get any food or water or anything. But we were heading south, and actually the weather was getting warmer and this and that. And we ended up near Munich at a at a camp called Mooseburg, which was Stalag 7A and been a British enlisted man camp and they put them out in work parties at the road and they put us in there and and, uh, and we started our over again without much stuff and and again had now the Germans were worse off, and we didn't have the the parcels, and the, the transportation system was broken down more, and, and uh, we were we were getting really low, and you know the rations were down to just German, and and uh, finally. They made some kind of a deal with the Swiss to get army trucks to them, and they put on red crosses on these army trucks, and they drove food parcels to us, Swiss drivers, to the camp. And from Switzerland to the camp. To the camp. From Switzerland yeah. to yeah. the camp, and we got <coughs> we got some. Parcels and and it it helped us uh, and there was a Russian camp near our next door to our camp and <laughs> I had a I had a little wristwatch that was like just better than a Mickey Mouse but not much and so through the fence of the Russian I bartered for food. Because they were out in the field and stuff, and could get stuff and potatoes and this and that, and I borrowed borrowed with them for this box of food and for my watch, and so he gave me the food and I threw the watch over. And that night I'm in my bunk and I get this shaking. No jeweling. <laughs> this Russian standing right there. No jewel. No jewel. You screwed me. <laughs> but hey, the food's gone. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, no jeweling. <laughs> but I still remember <laughs> that guy. How'd he get in our camp and found me? I don't know, but he did. So, <laughs> but but that's one of the more humorous little yeah. things. But. How did you? How was you actually uh, 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 saved? Uh, well, it was a nice day, and we heard rumbling, and a tank drove up and came through our front gate, and it was Patton's Third Army. So, so. Uh, we jumped all over the tank and we were liberated. And uh, this is still outside of Munich. Yeah, in yeah. Mooseburg. Yeah. And then about a week later, 
we said, give us back to the Germans because <laughs> we weren't, they didn't set up transport and they didn't, they brought in one load of bread, white bread once that was like cake. And, but, but then I, it, they just, they'd broken down. They just had too many prisoners, too many civilians, too many of this and that, and they were moving too fast. And I, a truck came, one, one of their lorries, or our soldiers from a artillery camp came to, to camp and, and uh, I, go, I went out with them with a, they let me a helmet and a jacket and I escaped our camp, went to their camp and... Uh, to the artillery camp? To this artillery camp. Yeah. And they fed me <laughs> a dinner, which I puked. So. I bet you did. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> and then I, I just kept going. I didn't ever go back to our camp. And you had your ID with you? No, I didn't have anything and, except me. And I went to, a, to a, an airfield that had been a German airfield and scrounged around in it. And I got a German field jacket and some other junk. And, and we thought maybe a transport would come in, we'd just get on them and get out of there. And that never happened then. So I kept bumming around and I finally, I finally was able to get back to our camp, at Camp Lucky Strike, where they were sending people out of the organized and giving you clothes and food and getting you to repatch train, yeah. you know, to bring you back on a, get you out of there, and, and big rumors were supposed to be flown out and all that, but, but anyway, I got back to this camp. You had to get back in the system. You went get back an ID to the, and, the original camp, say. Yeah, yeah, get into, not, not my original camp, but the camp where they brought all our prisoners to, I got to which was, and I had to re-enter the system, and I, and I got back into the camp, and this colonel that had been camp with me that I knew pretty well, and he had we'd ch played chess together and stuff, so he knew me, and he says, where have you been? And I said, oh, I've been to the dispensary. Where have you been? And he shut up, and, but anyway, I, I got away with my little, week of freedom or whatever it was, bumming around. But anyway, I got back in the system and and then they issued us clothes and this and that and, and uh, range for transportation. And I didn't come back like the Queen Mary. We came back on a, what had been a German ship, which was redone in our to the US but it had been the Grips home which was a ship that was the support ship for the Grass Bay in Mono de Vea, or whatever that ship down in South America and we uh, got the ship and that that made a transport out of it. Where did we you ship four out? deep. Where did you ship out from? Uh, we shipped out from Brest? From, no, Bremerham? no, La Harve. La Harve. And we shipped into New York. Okay. So I anyway, bet you were glad to get back. Yeah, and then the Statue of Liberty and the same old yeah. stuff. So then it's the same as everyone. Did you have to uh, prove your, uh, who you were? No, they do. They, they, no, uh, no, they, I didn't have any trouble getting identification and this and that. They yeah. they knew who you were and you, uh, they had pictures of you and they had your yeah. thing. And I still have a German ID and, and uh, their card of, with your picture on it. 
You've got souvenirs left over. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So. Then what, did they put you in a camp here in the States somewhere? Well, you, you came into Fort Dix and then put you on a train, not flying in those days, mostly train. And I came back and they gave you back to where? leave and that's, I came back to Coronado and on, uh, on rest camp or leave at the end of, you know, be, and then before reporting back in and then, then they dropped the bomb and the war this, ended before I. But you got to back to Coronado when you're about uh, probably in June, by June then. In, in uh, April, June or July. April, May, June. In 45. What about June 45? Uh, n well, it was late June because the war in Germany was over. Yeah. And it was just before. Which was August. Just be yeah, just before the. And, Were you written up in a Coronado paper? Yeah. There was a write up on you then. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Does uh, Dittler have it in the uh, his library? Pardon. Does Joe have it? Joe Dittler have it at the. No, he doesn't have any of my stuff unless he snooped around. No, I don't think so. No. Uh, uh, no. But there I am, back home. <laughs> Yeah, I bet court. your parents were glad to see you. Pardon? Your parents were glad to see you. Yeah, my father had died when I was young, but my mother and, and uh, yeah, they were, yeah, it was a big stress on, you know, the not knowing you're shot yeah. down, not hearing for three months whether you're alive. And Did your brother make it through okay? No, uh, no, my, my old, my old, I had two older brothers, and uh, my brother, was one that Clayton, one that went, was in flight school with me, had been in the service before, and they tried to sell him, the sergeant tried to make him pay for his flight clothes. And he turned him in. He didn't know anyone was gonna was how corrupt the system was, and they kicked him out. And he went to Canada and finished flight training, and then he was commissioned in the navy. He wouldn't go in the army because of that thing, and he went in as a naval officer. In the Canadian Navy? No, he, American. No, back into. After the war started, they, everyone that was going through Canadian or, or Limey or any place, they offered them commissions in the American, and very few people wouldn't go back. Yeah. And one of them that wouldn't go back was like Lance Wade. Yeah. And my brother wouldn't go back, so he, but he went in the Navy. Yeah. And he was commissioned in flew transports in the Navy, and then... But... <clears throat> uh, anyway, the... the yeah, uh, this is tape, tape three, yeah. with Richard Kenny. Kenny, uh, uh, the date is uh, June of 16th, 207, my name's Bob Wright. Uh, what did you do uh, after you got out of the Air Force? Or did you get out of the I Air Force? I didn't get out. No, you didn't I, get out. I, I was in refresher training when the war ended. Korea? No, no. When, oh, excuse me. When they dropped the, the big bomb. bomb and the, I had volunteered to go to the Pacific. Jeez, I needed all that. Well, I needed another another victory. They were easy. Oh, over you want there. to get number five? Yeah, and they were easy over there, you know. So my friends, all the guys that were no good at all, had my wingman. My wingman was shot down in after I was, but 
they sent him to an Italian prison work camp, and the Italians quit, and he walked out of it, and was able to return back, and he went to the Pacific and got about six more victories. <laughs> what was your wingman's name? His name was Curtis, Louis Curtis. Okay. And he, uh, and he, he was, he was, uh, he was a jerk, but he was a good pilot. But but he went, he got, in other words, when, when the Italians quit, then all their guards walked away from the camp, and he went with the partisans, and then our lines came through where they were, and he get, went back to U.S. control, and then he volunteered to, to go to the Pacific. And and he was flying P fifty ones. Now you uh, you went back to uh, back in the states and you started flying again. Right. After you gained some weight back. Yeah, getting, eating pretty good. Yeah, they actually gave us extra rations and stuff for when you got home. As you remember, because you were around then, they had food rations and oh, yeah. and gas rations. And I was, uh, I went to Bakersfield, a place called Minnersfield, and they gave us 20 hours of flight time in this in, in T-6s. Sure. And, and the war was over and no one wanted pilots. And uh, there was no place to send people. And so I was, Getting my 20 hours of my last hour, I was up with the squadron commander, and, and he said, how would you like to stay and instruct today? What are you talking about? I hadn't been flying for two years, you know, all these other people. And I, once I realized he was me, I said, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> so this guy was a major, and he said, well, then I'll make this a standardization ride as well as your final ride, and I found myself instructing the next day. And so all, then my wingman comes through from the Pacific, and he doesn't like going through that program at all with these training commandos, and he's giving them all a hard time, and he's the big A's, double A's, you know, yeah. and, he's, and they're training commandos, which is what I instructed. And so I said, I didn't tell him I knew him, but I said, I'll take him. <laughs> and so, what the hell are you doing instructing him? And I said, because I'm better than you are, you jerk. <laughs> You're always going to be a jerk. You're always going to be under me. So, <laughs> so anyway, and then I'd made up my mind, the war was over then, that, that I'd go back to college. but. I put in for a regular commission. I said if I didn't get it, I'd go back to college. And, and I was right when all the, I got a regular commission right off. And, and so they were having rifts at that time, reduction in forces. Yeah. And since I was. All right, good. So anyway, I don't know how much or how far you want oh. to go with us. Yeah, no, let, no. yeah. But but anyway, I I found myself on a on a board to review everyone else, and and my we we're at this board and we we're going through this colonel was running a regular old fussy full colonel and, and he said does anyone know so and so and, he, and my best buddy came up and, does anyone know this guy and I said I do and he said what kind of a guy he says oh he's a nice guy this colonel says we don't need any nice guys <laughs> and he throws him in the out basket but that night the recorder and I 
did a little adjustment. People we thought were more deserving. But anyway, it became an inside joke if somebody wanted to know what kind of a person. Oh, he's a nice guy. <laughs> now this, in case we missed the, on that the tape, uh, that wouldn't, no. you were in this up, in, up by Bakersfield and in this uh, uh, re, re uh, uh, yeah. educating yourself on flying and yeah, you it was a these refresher guys refresher course. Yeah. Pardon? Refresher, 20 yeah. hours you got. 20 of, hour refresher. Of refresher, yeah. There, because, everyone. Prisoners, people coming from the Pacific. All, all, everyone went through this little twin. Now these guys were wanted to stay in the service. Pardon? These were fellows. No, were, this was everyone. Everyone. Yeah, and then, then, as I was saying, then they started having rifts where there were a lot of people voluntarily got out right then. They were just asked you, "What do you want to do?" I want out. Yeah. And they just gave him a discharge because the war was over. But then a lot of people wanted to stay, but there were too many of them and not enough. They were reducing flying outfits and they didn't need them anymore. Yeah. And so they had all these surplus people. And that's what the RIF was, reduction in forces. And But I got a regular commission and so I was on the board. What was your rank by that time? I was, I was still a lieutenant. You must have been first by then. Yeah, I, I was first, but I was first by the War Department that had been in long enough. They gave me a permanent first lieutenant, but I was chipped on the. They had a program that prisoners of war was called Project R. And they gave you a promotion, and it came up for me to get my promotion. And they, they said, "We well, already got a promotion." Yeah. I said, "Hey, that's a. I got a regular. I mean, I got a promotion uh, by the War Department just because it was time to give me a promotion to first lieutenant." But I said I should get one because I was a flight leader and this and that. And they said, oh, you already got a promotion. We're not going to give you another one. But my the guy that gave me my flight check and asked me if I wanted to stay found out I was in his upper class. He was a major. So he put me in for a promotion. To captain? And to captain. And I did get it, but I wouldn't, didn't get it right then. I got it a little while later that it had already transferred to Mather Field, which they closed the base that we were in in the refresher training. They closed Minter. And, and even though it was a, not a fighter base and stuff, it was a flying job, and they transferred me to Mather. Yeah. And at Mather, I, f I was flying navigators training in in B-25s and in and radar navigation and radar guys. Yeah. Uh, listen, let's, can we jump ahead? All right. Did you end up in Korea? Yeah. Yeah, let's jump ahead then. Two. How did you do that? Well. I I weaseled my way out to instructed at, at Williams Field, the first jet outfit, and I started flying jets, P-80s. P-80. Yeah. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah. Right. Shooting the Lockheed. Star. Shooting Star. And I picked up the first two-seater that delivered to the to the Air Force for trading. And that became a toy, and they sent me to San Diego, and I flew. The editor of San Diego Union, which his name was Steely, and he wrote a fairy tale story of it. And then they sent me to Washington D.C., and I flew the Secretary of Defense Forrestal in it. Early jets would 
uh, and they sent all the support equipment to Washington National, which is what now uh, Ronald Reagan, Reagan. But anyway, I flew him, and and then I went to the Navy on exchange program and flew F-80, same airplane, in their first jet training unit outfit at Pensacola, Florida, for a year, and. And then I went back and got transferred to Nellis, which was the top of the, and Nellis was combat crew training for F-86s yeah. to go to Korea. And I was operations officer in a squadron there and shooting gunnery and every day and everything. And I was trying to correspond myself over to, to Korea where all the meets were. And I <clears throat> finally got orders over there, and I was going to the fourth where all the MiG pilots were, and, and anyway, and on the way over, General Tacklin that I worked for before, uh, Nellis said that if you'll come to the 18th, which was I'll give you the 67 Fighter Bomber Squadron. And he said, if you go to the 4th, you're going to be flying safety officer. And he said, right now they're talking about not about peace anyway, we're not allowed to go north. And, and so I told him that I'd go to the he was really my great white father. I'd had him several times. And, yeah. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come to the... And then the North Vietnamese heard that the first team was coming and, and quit. North Koreans. Yeah. North Korean. <laughs> A different war. Yeah. Uh, what the... <laughs> you, you must have really liked flying then. Well, I... Flying's my life, and uh, I uh, I spent the whole my whole career flying to the to the sacrifice of everything else, including family and this and that. You weren't well. You weren't married then. No, right? and you couldn't be married and do the job I was doing. But anyway, I I spent I spent a total. I ended up with 6,000 hours of military time, mostly jail. And, uh, and then I got a, and I was, I, I had, in my career, I, I was commander of five fighter squadrons. That, that's pretty much, most people were yeah. lucky to get one. And that's. You went out as a colonel, didn't you? Yeah, two. I I had two F-100 squadrons, and then in Japan I had a F-84 F-100 squadron, and then I I ended up in um, as director of operations at Myrtle Beach. Did you see combat in in Korea in Pardon? the F-86? No, I I told you they they. They knew the first team was coming, those North Koreans quit. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, the dirty guys. So. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. They quit before you got yeah. out of there then. No, right at the time. At the time. Yeah, I probably. I got there and they were started well, they standing. they knew you were coming, see. Yeah. <laughs> and they stand down. They started standing down right about then. <laughs> and we got orders not to go north. I was flying at the same time, but. Yeah. But they quit, and I was flying fighter bombers. Yeah. And uh, and then a year there doing, flying just gunnery and bombing and just playing for uh, for the miserable. Everyone started counting boxes and days. You know, at the end of a tour of you know that was a lousy place to be, Korea anyway in those days. Yeah. I can't believe that they've had Olympics. And they're building giant ships, and they're building 
all this stuff now, and cars, all kinds, of, and then they, it was like a banjo, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, so, but uh, it's, it's something else. Uh, did you ever get married? Did you get married? Oh, that's part of this is unclassified part, so. Oh, yeah. oh. But I told, yeah, I said that I always kept my personal life out of uh, this kind of stuff. But okay. I, I the just, other thing is that you, when did you actually get out of the Air Force? Okay, I, I, I so when I got out was, I was, a, I had, I was the director of operations at a NATO rotation type wing. And we had a squadron either at Aviano, where all the flights are going to, where, where they're supporting the, yeah. you know, Cosmo and stuff. And then I had a, if we weren't there, we were at Insula, Turkey, on the NATO rotation. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> I uh, I got a a call from my deputy who was in v early Vietnam. He was in the headquarters over there, and he said the general's asking for you for a job here uh, to be a head air lane officer in in uh, this is early in Vietnam war. That was in the 64, 60s. and yeah. very early. And uh, he said, "It's a, if if you can possibly get out of it, don't come, because it's a dead end job. It's it's you were fighting the army over missions and this and that, and it's not a flying job." And and he said, uh, and I said. He was named, named Ray Robinson. He was, uh, he had been my deputy in Myrtle Beach. And I knew him very well. He was a good, good guy. But uh, I said, "Well, Ray, I'm not going to go." Uh, I said, "I've. They just grounded me, and I've had to fight them to get back on flying status." And and I said, "I have to take a physical every." Three months for high blood pressure and with a with a fight surgeon, and <clears throat> and I said they're after me. They've already tried to ground me, and I had to get a special waiver and right? And I said, I'm, it's a remote assignment. They should be sudden, and and I'm not going. I'm gonna. I I said I have 27 years. I'd like to do 30, but I'm gonna retire if they make me go if they keep me on those orders. And so I, I went, flew in to Andrews and went to the Pentagon and I talked to the personnel general and he, he started he started giving me all this rah rah stuff and I said, <coughs> General, did you ever really look at my at my record very well? And he said, What do you mean? I said I had two tours in this Pentagon. Don't give me this rah rah stuff. <laughs> and so I said, No, I'm gonna, I said, take me off that that thing. And I said, I, You'll have to replace me in Myrtle Beach if I don't. And I said, I'm not going, period. I'm going to retire. And he said, No, you're in a short list for general. You won't retire. And I said, Yes, yes, I will. And he watched me. And I knew I was going to lose the battle unless I went to my ex boss. They're in the Pentagon, and but since they were, since they were hassling me over physical and everything, I said, yeah, I said no. I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out, and uh, so I, and I knew I'd lose the battle with them. I, I told this general, I said, he said your name, I said unname me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's when I. That was way back now. I've been out longer well, than I was in. But what year did you retire then? That's 64. 64. Look at how long that is. Yeah, yeah. A long time did ago. You, did you get a civilian job later on? Well, I, I, 
didn't want to work for anyone else, and I didn't want to go in the airline and be a trash carrier pile. <coughs> so I, the only place I had was I'd build a cabin at Tahoe, in Lake Tahoe, and I went to there, and then I built a year-round house, and then I got big in skiing, and I bought a ski area, and I ended up getting officiating for the for the USSA Ski Association, and I got to be a technical delegate for the International Federation of Ski. That means wow. the guy that runs the Olympic Games and yeah. the FIS races. Time. So you didn't have any property in Coronado then, did you? Yeah, uh, no. At that time, I'd sold my property. My I, your, mo your mother still had the property here? No, I'd sold it when she died. Yeah. I had my, as you know, this little city was built in 25 foot lots. Yeah. And our house was built on 150 feet. Wow. And, and so I sold it some miserable low price at the time that she passed away. But that's not regrettable. Yeah. I, and then my sister li lived here that was married to a naval officer and they retired here and my niece still lives here, my only relative is left. You, uh, the reason why I'm asking this is uh, if you're up to it, <clears throat> I got a blank tape here. I'd like to just talk about Coronado All right. for the Historical Society. All right. if you're yeah, up to it. Okay, yeah. so uh, I th think we could end this uh, tape here about your Air Force time. That's it. That's it. Huh? That's when I was retiring right then. And when did you move back to Coronado? Well, I, I spent 20 years at Tahoe in the snow, and then I decided I didn't want to shovel snow, and I moved back to Coronado. In 83, I bought a home here, this thing. And in 84, I moved here. Yeah, 30, 30, 337. 337, Laurieta Place. Place, yeah. Not Charm Laurieta, on the wrong side of the tra railroad tracks. Yeah, well, you're doing okay. Yeah, and... So listen, thank you for this uh, this part of the interview, and then we, on that cassette, we'll sift over and do the court just talk Coronado, and that tape will go to the, to uh, this tape will go to the San Diego Historical Society. This one uh, we could make a DVD and give it to the Aerospace Museum, and that, and that probably won't do a thing with it, knowing them, because they've got big trouble up there. Yeah, I know they do. Five hundred thousand dollars worth. Yeah, but in spite of it. I have friends that know the guy, and they claim that the new guy that they're maligning is actually a pretty sharp guy, and I don't know. But I'm not in it. No. I I don't know anything about it. But but just two days ago, guys told me that's a pretty savvy guy, and he said, "No, this guy, the guy, president guy that's now," he said that the money problem were not his fault. He inherited it. Yeah. And that he is sharp enough to be able to, you know, do something about it. Yeah, the, the previous, the one that just Yeah, that one that's previous to this present guy yeah, is the one that got him in deep doo-doo. Yeah. And before that it had been solvent. Yeah. But I've never I've never spent much attention to That's a pretty good air museum otherwise. Yeah, I've been there and that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the Marine one and and, and uh, I've given them some memorabilia and stuff, but yeah. That's about it. But you know, it is it is goodness. They're very hard to make a now the Midway guy claims they're solvent and doing very well, and it's the most visited ship in the you know yeah. in the whole museum system, and 
this and that. But, uh, but yeah. anyway. Okay, let so thank you very much for uh, everybody. Well, wow. thanks for coming, Bob. Now, I'll, uh, he's driving my Model T around all the time. Yeah, I want to talk about that. See how you sound here. I'll get back down there. Now the midway guy claims they're solvent, doing very well. See that thing? Got to come on better. Ship. Take a head break. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I'll get up in a minute. Was uh, <clears throat> what squadron he flew in at the 12th Air Force? He flew in the 95th Squadron, 82nd Fighter Group out of North Africa in the uh, 12th Air Force. Uh, and he flew these. Uh, P-38 till he got shot down. Uh, he had uh, has had suffered suffered uh, a couple of minor strokes, uh, and that's why he's rather slow talking. And uh, so the t interview has gone so long. <laughs>